Michael Turner is a theoretical cosmologist, emeritus professor at the University of Chicago, and former director of the Kavli Institute for Cosmological Physics. He's a pioneer in exploring what he called the dark side of the universe. He actually coined the term dark energy, and his revolutionary ideas led to the cold dark matter theory of structure formation. Mike's contributions to modern physics are truly invaluable, and I'm beyond thrilled to have him as a guest on my show. Join us in a deep dive into the dark side of our twisted universe. Welcome everybody to a very important, meaningful, and delightful episode of the Into the Impossible podcast with an impossibly brilliant guest who I've been uh, really you know, in love with his mind since I was a wee lad, a graduate student. Uh, he's a legend in the field, and it's uh, Professor Michael Turner, at University of Chicago, a theoretical cosmologist who, among many things, is rumored to have coined the term dark energy. Michael, is that correct? Did you coin the term dark energy? Uh, gu guilty as charged. <laughs> who coined the, uh, I guess, Wiki coined the term dark matter in German, correct? That's right. Uh, I can't pronounce the German, Dunkel Mater, or something like that. Yeah, I think you're, you're closer than I'll ever get to it. Uh, Michael, where are you joining us from today? Um, I'm joining uh, from my office in Venice, California. I really appreciate your time and whatever you'll spare in person or online. But, Mike, we have a lot to talk about. We'll run out of time. Before I run out of questions, I beg your forbearance as we go into the very first question that I ask all my guests who honor me with uh, their presence on my humble podcast, and that is to judge a book by its cover. And in your case, your book with Rocky Kolb, your uh, colleague at the University of Chicago, uh, has uh, really influenced generations of, of cosmologists, of, of theoretical particle physicists, astrophysicists, uh, experimentalists like myself. And I want to uh, do the following, if you will. To judge the book by its cover, I would like you to describe the cover art, the cover title, and the subtitle. How did you and Rocky Kolb come up with that? The original hardback version had a very boring cover. It was just white and the words early universe. And if my memory serves me correct, there was no subtitle. And um, the paperback version, which you may be referring to, uh, has a wonderful story with it. The cover is a beautiful image of a galaxy, actually, for its time. I mean, today we get much better images from uh, JWST and, and the Hubble. So the title, that was exceedingly easy. Um, Rocky and I uh, were pioneers of studying the first microsecond. And uh, I like to tell the joke, by the time we got to cosmology, you know, everybody specializes. All that was left was the first microsecond. And that is the early universe. But we got there at a very good time because the early universe had just opened up. Shortly before we got there, you couldn't talk about the early universe because it was just a mess. Uh, it was nuclei and protons and neutrons sitting on top of one another. And we were there when the doors opened, when people realized that it was quark soup. And early universe, it, you know, a good title's got to be simple. Uh, it's got to have cosmology. And uh, early was where it was at. Do you want to hear the paperback version? Yeah, because we're going to springboard from the paperback to a discussion of these peculiar properties of galaxies, which in my mind, Mike, I'm not going to teach, I'm not going to let the student teach the master, but a galaxy is not exactly, at least when I was a kid, an early universe phenomenon of the first microsecond. So yes, how did that come to be? The Whirlpool Galaxy. So that's perfect. Our, our, our book did really, really well, um, and it was going into paperback, and I was in Aspen, Colorado. And they sent the artwork to me for the new cover. And it was this beautiful picture of a galaxy. And uh, I called up Rocky. Um, and he said, well, you got the cover artwork. What do you think? And I said, it's beautiful, but it has nothing to do with our book. And, <laughs> and he said, we'll take it. So our book is about the first microsecond. But that's where the blueprint for the universe got laid out. And that's where galaxies can trace their origins to. So it's not quite fair to say that uh, it was a bait and switch, that it's not really about the pretty galaxies you see in the sky. But the cover was chosen because, oh my God, well, the, 
I wish I had could easily get copies here. It's so funny. Rocky and I pioneered a lot of ground there. I think we were book number 69. And David, we, we asked David to make some changes because he had a standard preface that talked about, um, you know, these are not to be designed to be polished. And uh, they're typically from mimeographed notes. Yeah. And we said to David, David, what is a mimeograph machine? And uh, so we changed some of his uh, forward, but they had a standard, you know, that's important when you have a brand. Frontiers in Physics was a brand, and it was very simple. It was white and blue. But then when some other publishing company took it over and did the paperback, they made it really fancy. It's still in the top 200 of books in astrophysics, even, you know, it's uh, coming up on its 30th, 30th anniversary incredible of the of the second edition i think yeah and i just i just got a royalty check yesterday wow well that's that's uh that's uh what all us authors uh make our make our living yeah and i'm gonna go to starbucks and have a coffee on it (laughs) all right well let's get into some of the topics in there but uh, particularly i wanted to be a little persnickety and and kind of poke fun yeah the galaxy is sitting there and we've heard a lot lately about conflicts not only with the structure formation within Lambda CDM, Lambda Cold Dark Matter uh, model, the prevailing paradigm, I would say. Not only that, but whether or not the Big Bang even happened. I don't know if you paid attention to this. There's some fringe. I won't call them crackpots. I won't call them cranks. I'll, I'll let somebody else do that. But there are people out there that are claiming and getting tremendous amount of attention, even from all the way up to Elon Musk who was a physics major at UPenn for some time, as I understand it. But he tweeted out, and Joe Rogan, who's become a friend of mine, tweeted out things about this. But anyway, Michael, what do you make of this controversy? Is it a tempest in a celestial teapot, as Dawkins might say? Uh, yes. Um, so, um, but, let, let me, the, you know, the, the rich science is more complicated than was there a Big Bang or not? Uh, it's never yes or no. And... I like to organize my thinking in science about things we know for sure that are never going away. So one thing we know for sure that's never going away is the universe is expanding. I would add to that, we also know that the, uni- the expansion is speeding up, but we can get to dark energy later. So the universe is expanding. We have so much evidence for that. That's no- never going away. Well, if it's, if it's getting bigger than in the past, it was smaller. And so... If you extrapolate its size all the way back, the extrapolations would say, uh, you know the number better than I do, 13.8 billion years ago, it had zero size. Uh, And that's called the Big Bang. Um, And the Big Bang theory is, you know, one of those funny things in science. It's not a theory about the Big Bang. It's a theory about the events after the Big Bang. So the stuff that we know for sure... The, the number one thing we know for sure is that the universe was much, much smaller in the past. And I would say that the one, number one thing we know for sure, how far, you know, when you say how small, do you really mean zero? Very, 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 very strong evidence takes it back to a size that is 10 trillion times smaller than it is today. That's a lot smaller. Does it take it back to zero? No. And one of the big questions in uh, cosmology that's going to take a while to answer is, was there a Big Bang? Was there ever a time when the universe had zero size? And that's a really rich question. Another thing we know for sure that you know for sure, you've spent your career studying it, is it was a hot Big Bang. So it, it wasn't just any old Big Bang. In the past, it was really hot. And I, I don't know if you're allowed to use words like this on your show, but I use it in it. In the technical sense, it was hotter than hell. And uh, so that comes to us from the cosmic microwave background. There's a microwave echo of the Big Bang. And that we can even get a picture of the universe. It's 13.8 billion years old today. We can get a picture of the universe when it was only 380,000 years old, the infant universe. Not 380,000 years ago, but when it was 380,000 years old, before galaxies and stars and all that. So the idea that, I mean, if you want to you know, have an Oxford debate about you know, whether or not there was a Big Bang, then if I were arguing, no, there wasn't, I would say, well, the Big Bang is you know, when the universe was zero size, and we can't really say that. 
But the idea that the universe was much, much smaller, much, much hotter, and uh, grew to a size today, that's, that's really the Big Bang theory, which is the events after the Big Bang. And I know there are people, some of them are engineers, some of them have degrees. I think there's someone who even wrote a book called The Big Bang Never Happened, Eric Lerner. That's right. He's a provocateur. Who, I even bought his book. I shouldn't have done it, but I did it because I was giving a lecture, a public lecture in Aspen when the book came out. And his, in fact, you will enjoy this, I hope. His number one piece of evidence is a very long book with a lot of words, but he had one piece of evidence was we hadn't found the small variations in the intensity of the microwave background that need to be there to explain galaxies. And what was funny about this book is it was literally written six months before those variations were discovered and made your career possible because your whole career has been spent doing this extraordinarily hard work of studying these tiny, tiny variations that give us a picture of the infant universe. And you know this, and, and most scientists, this is, science is a continuing process where I would say we're, we're very firm on understanding the universe back to a microsecond. And earlier than that, I would, that, that goes into my second bin of really well-formulated ideas that are knocking at the door to become fact. And inflation is one of those ideas knocking at the door to become fact. Another idea that's knocking at the door to become fact is that the dark matter that we just touched upon very briefly earlier uh, is made of uh, elementary particles left over from the Big Bang. That is not fact. You know, I would never, you know, say that that's fact. We have a lot of evidence for it, but it's really banging at the door, but we don't have the case for it yet. Likewise for inflation. There's a lot of, um, and so it's really easy to, you know, throw mud and get a headline. The Big Bang never happened. You know, if I said, oh, the Big Bang happened, we found another piece of evidence for it. And I go to the editor of your, uh, you know, the San Diego Union paper. Can I get that on the front page? Nah, I don't think so. I have someone who will say the Big Bang never happened. Can I get that on the front page? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's the uh, the Big Bang's bleeding, so it's leading. Um, exactly. Yeah, I, I make a lot of that. I, I made a video refuting Mr. Lerner of the Plasma Physics Institute uh, of uh, Western Phil uh, Pennsylvania, and, and that's fine. There, there's another gentleman, uh, Rajendra Gupta, at the University of Ottawa, who's an actual professor and has worked in this field, and... He reduced the age of the universe, you know, from infinity and static to um, to a mere 27 billion years. And, you know, I'm happy to talk to these people. I generally think along the lines of Lord Martin Rees that, you know, debate is pointless. It's, it's not like people change their mind. Uh, you know, they love to hear debates. They love to watch debates. But it's like a baseball game. You go and see your your bears and, and you don't want them to uh, to to lose. It's not like you you really want to you know see a great man. No, you want them to blow the other team out. At least I do with the Padres. We know the Bears are going to lose, unfortunately. Yeah, I know. Well, the same with the Padres. But at least you've had a team that, you know, at least the Cubs have won a World Series. The Padres never have. But let's turn to uh, to inflation because, uh, as I said before we press record, your papers were really influential on on experimentalist. And I don't know if you realize that, but but a lot of us who, you know, began – our careers, you know, in in the '90s with with Colbin Turner, later turned our attention to the search for some circumstantial, but ne um, nevertheless very probative information about inflation were to occur. And one of the most influential papers on a generation, my generation, was you know your papers on the scorecard for inflation. And I don't know if you can you know take us back to to what it meant when you prepare these um, uh, these these papers. Do you do you think about the audience as being you know particular people like young Brian Keating's experimentalist phenomenologist? How do you how did you develop the brand of uh, and the taste that you have to develop things that would be of great utility to theorists? observers and experimentalists what goes be what went into that thought process of that particular series of papers in science there are people who just want to be clever and write clever papers some of the theorists are that way and that that's really important to have clever ideas and tools out there and um and then then there are people who um would like 
to have clever ideas that are testable and let's see if they're right or wrong. And if they're wrong, oh, whatever. But if they're right, that's, that's very, very cool. And uh, early universe cosmology um, underwent a transition. Uh, in the early days, we were just having a lot of fun. I mean, we, we would invent a new kind of universe every week. And, and uh, discovery of those small variations in the uh, intensity of the microwave background uh, in 1992, April 23rd, that was a really big deal because that meant you could really start testing these ideas. I've gone on record many places saying this. I've said it in a lot of papers. Alan Goose's theory of inflation is the second most important idea in cosmology ever, after the Big Bang, after George Gamow's Big Bang, whether or not it's right. And it has directed the field um, since his 1980 paper. It might have been 1981 when it was published. And so starting in the early 90s, there was the idea you might be able to test this theory. And it's a theory about events that happened a jiffy after the Big Bang. You, you know what a jiffy is, right? Yeah, it's a skosh. <laughs> it's a little more than a skosh. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's a micro skosh. And oh, no, maybe it's a it's 10 skoshes. I always get that screwed up. So very early, you know, maybe 10 to the minus 35 seconds. And so you want to guide people. You also... Um, and I want to test this on you. Sometimes people think science is a cabal, right? Brian and Michael work together. And so big, big cosmology. Yeah. Conspiratorial cosmology. Brian wants to confirm Michael's ideas and then, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and typically the best compliment an experimentalist can pay to a theorist is to try to disprove the theorist's idea. And inflation was like that. It's boldest prediction and this was slightly before your time, but one of your mentors was involved in this. Its absolute boldest prediction was that the universe is flat, that it has the critical density. And the astronomers used to roll their eyes because they said, oh, my God, the, we already know that the density is not the critical density. It's only 10 percent. And so, you know, we love that inflation and the false vacuum energy and all that stuff, but change the flat universe. And maybe later I'll tell you a story about where it almost got changed, but it didn't. And we stuck with the flat universe and uh, then dark energy came along. And the person who showed that that was the first major test of inflation, because all the evidence at the time, uh, which was not perfect, it was just based upon counting up matter and you could only count up matter um, close to galaxies, said no, you missed by a factor of 10. That's a pretty big error. One of your, I assume he was one of your, your mentors, Andrew Lang at Caltech. He was your postdoctoral mentor, I think. That's right. Yeah, he and I made bicep. And I don't know That's if you right. were involved in his boomerang experiment. It was a balloon. I wasn't. No, he hired me after I got fired by Sarah Church at Stanford. And then, but she kindly arranged for a meeting with Andrew Lang, who had been her postdoc advisor. And then the rest, as they say, is history. And we went on with Jamie Bach to build bicep. And then bicep, I hope we get to that because I am, I am just in love with bicep. As a father, I, I, take, I take great uh, satisfaction. <laughs> but anyway, Andrew's balloon experiment uh, was fantastic. And that's how I met Andrew. We, we were together on the NASA press conference and we flew back from Washington, D.C. to Chicago. I had booked him for a colloquium. And that, that was the first big piece of evidence. And then the, what, you, what you have spent most of your career studying, these small variations in the intensity of the microwave background across the sky, about a part in 10 to the 5, really, really small, very, very hard to measure. That's a big area where you, where you, could, where you could test it. Uh, how do they vary from angle to angle and getting more technical? What are their statistics and so on and so forth? And so you got to spell that out. First of all, if you ever want your, if you ever want people to say, oh, you made a prediction and it was confirmed, you got to make the prediction before it was confirmed. After it's confirmed, you say, oh, yeah, no, 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 that's what I predicted. Retro diction, yeah. Yeah, my neighbors do that. You know, every, everybody does that. Eric Lerner does that. But you've got to get the predictions. And you also have to say, here's what's really important. One of the ones I take the most pride in in that paper, these variations we have this term called scale invariant. So they, they don't change from scale to scale. 
But a very important thing is they're not scale invariant. They're almost scale invariant. And um, I believe um, my collaborators and I were the first ones to put that word in front of there saying an important test is that they're not quite scale invariant. So they're close, but they're 10% off. And if you find them to be exactly scale invariant, that, that would not be a feather in inflation's hat. You want them to be slightly off, and they indeed are 10% off, and, and the experimentalists really paid attention to that. That was a big goal. Can we show that there's a statistically significant deviation from scale invariance? And then the one that, the big one, and I think most of my papers, um, I'm glad I was detecting the gravity wave signature, which at the time when I, when, when I started writing, it'd be interesting to go back and look at the paper. That was going to be, that was so difficult to do. There was no, that one looked undoable. But you, if you're a theorist, you can't say, oh, by the way, here's a really cool prediction, but you're never going to do it. You've got to say, this is a really cool prediction. Um, it may be impossible today, but cutting edge science is making the impossible just really hard. And that's what you guys have done at BICEP. I mean, BICEP, to me, I am the biggest fan of BICEP. And when uh, I know you had, I don't know if I want to call it a misstep, but a false alarm or whatever it's called. I am your biggest defender because you guys set your sight on a goal and you, ju you, you are more sensitive in looking for this signature. Uh, it's an important test of inflation because if you find this gravitational wave signature, you find out when inflation took place. Bop, just like that. And, but it's really, really hard. It's more than a decade that you've been doing this. And you just keep, I watch you guys every, if, if I, if I would give you a hundred dollars, you would go buy some more detectors for the focal plane because every penny, penny that comes into this project, you, you make the, the experiment more sensitive and it's sitting down there at the South Pole. I hope it's running right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's been upgraded. It's on the fourth generation now. It's called bicep array. You know, it went from bicep one, bicep two, bicep three, and now we uh, gave up the creative naming scheme. But yeah, speaking of money, that's, you know, you mentioned the, the royalties you're getting from the early universe. And... <laughs> hey, friends, just a short request to ask you to use your thumb while my thumb is occupied to leave a like on this video. And don't forget to subscribe. It really helps us with the algorithm. Now back to the episode. Now you understand the reason that I'm calling you today, uh, Michael. Um, so let's talk about inflation um, just a little bit. I, I do want to say one thing. You brought up the very important fact that is missed by 99% of lay people and almost 100% of scientists, which is that the job of an experimentalist is not to prove theories. Our job, I call myself a theory exterminator uh, because that's really what we should do. And I tell my students, Michael, and I wonder what you would tell a student, you know, starting off nowadays, but I say my experimentalist, I want you, experimentalist, to understand theory as well as a beginning theory graduate student. I just don't require that you come up with new theories or new tests or new models, but you should understand what you're doing at least as well as a, as a theorist. Otherwise, you're – and I'm not, you know, condemning – plumbers and electricians, but that's what I spend most of my time doing. I'm an electrician, a plumber, a technician, a uh, vacuum tube plumber, you know, looking for leaks in helium lines. I mean, this is not something I needed to get a PhD in, in cosmology to do necessarily. But what would you, what is the theoretical minimum? I told you the experimental minimum. I want my grad students to know theory at least as well as a grad student in theory. I don't require him or her to make new theories. What's the theoretical minimum, to use Lenny's term? I agree with everything you say, and I'm glad that's you're telling your students that. But what's interesting about science, and we'll come back to baseball, but I won't mention those pathetic Padres. Science is a team sport. Um, you're in a, and I don't mean collaborations. You're in a collaboration, but more generally, it's a team sport. So let me just talk about the theory side. So we need theorists who write papers where every damn one of them you can trust. You can take the numbers to the bank. And um, so that's somebody who gets on base, hits singles. In theory, there is a role for people who um, swing for the fences, the Babe Ruths. And yes. most of their at-bats are strikeouts. We need those two. And you might say, well, which one do you want? I want both because if no one's on base when you hit the home runs – 
And so, uh, and it's same in experiment. I know, I know um, actually in your field, in the microwave background, there are some people in your field who are extremely distinguished. I don't want to mention names because this could be taken the wrong way, but who know how to get the science. Then there are people who know how to invent the instrumentation, uh, but don't have a clue about the science. But they, and so if you get those two together, uh, Andrew could do both. And actually, Andrew also could conduct the, the orchestra. So he could put right. together... He could manage, manage the baseball team. He could he manage could the baseball team. And so I think science requires a whole bunch of, of different skill sets on the theory side. Um, but I guess all of them involve, you know, being able to um, work abstractly and having command of the mathematics of the day. I like to tell classes that the history, in the history of science... Um, well, you may push back on this. Um, mathematics has always been the pacing item, pacing item, and I can make a pretty good case about that. That uh, you know, we had the Greeks, and oh my God, uh, nothing happened. And then Euclid invented geometry, and uh, algebra helped. Uh, the Arabs invented algebra, and then Newton came along and invented calculus. And you can you can see where our understanding of the universe jumped. Non-Euclidean geometry, uh, Einstein came along, it was so abstract that uh, people have a hard time believing this. Einstein was not a very good mathematician and he had his hired hand, Marcel Grossman. Grossman, yeah. that's right. Um, and so mathematics, a theorist has to know math and do they have to know absolutely, uh, you know, the cutting edge math, or can the, they can't know old fashioned math? Like, if all you're good at is geometry, I think you might not be a great theorist, but you, you don't necessarily have to know string theory. So, it takes a different skill sets. And you know the Weinberg Salam theory. Oh, my goodness, Nobel Prize winners. Um, Shelley, who's a good friend, always swings for the fences. He is the big idea guy. Past guest on the podcast. Shelley is amazing. He hates string theory. That's a whole nother. I, I can't explain that. We'll do that at a different time. Yeah. And uh, Steve sweat the details. And the combination of them getting the Nobel Prize is so crazy because the, the two of them competed in high school, Bronx High School of Science. And there they are. You know, you, you know, you're judging how good you are by how many other people are at my level. There's another guy who's as smart as I am. They both end up as assistant professors at Harvard, sharing the same secretary. And then Steve gets famous for his paper on what's now called the weinberg salam glashow model. Shelley forgot he had invented the model because it was one of his strikeouts, because he didn't have a way that there was something missing from the model. And so then Shelley, oh my God, I hope you're, oh boy, I'm being, uh, but I, Shelley has said all of this in print. He said Weinberg installed the toilet in his beautiful model, and that which is the Higgs mechanism. But so I say this: they're both brilliant. You, we would not have the Weinberg Salam Glashow theory without the two of them and Abdus Salam. And I'm sure you see it in experiment. There's some people in your collaboration who are developing detectors for 20 years ahead, and you're trying to say, "Yeah, but we're trying to get these working at the South Pole." That's right. And well. They're not going to help yeah, you I mean, with that. Love, we love to plan. We love to forecast ahead. It's, it's You sort of get a little bit of the thrill of the, you know, it's like when I say I wanted to drop, you know, five pounds. Uh, I'm glad to say I did it, Michael. I dropped five pounds, but it was from my chin to my waist. It wasn't that far. But um, <clears throat> and later on, I want to ask you, I have a tradition. I'm going to ask you to ask my next guest a question. My next guest is none other than uh, Gerard at Hooft. I can't. The first thing is, how do you pronounce his name? Uh, but uh, he's he's agreed to answer some questions on the podcast. So I'd love to get a question from you to Gerard or Gerard, <clears throat> if you're if you're willing to play that. Oh, at the yeah, very I'll end play of the, that game in a couple of minutes. But um, but before we do, I would be remiss. I had on um, this guy David Chalmers. I don't know if you know who he is. He's he's a, a philosopher at New York University. He came up with this concept called the the hard problem of consciousness. I had on a guy named Nick Bostrom, 
and he invented the term the the um, singular not the singularity um, that's Ray Kurzweil uh, the simulation hypothesis. So all these guys come on, and one's from Australia, and David Chalmers is from Australia. And I said, David, look, it would be if it would be as if I had on you know uh, ACDC, and I didn't ask them to sing Back in Black. Uh, you are the creator, the father, the paternal figure of dark energy. I would be as equally remiss as I would have been with Bostrom if I didn't ask you know, him. I, I gave the example of ABBA. If I didn't ask him to sing Dancing Queen because he's from Sweden. Anyway, tell me, please, Michael, how did this come to you? What was the motivating, inciting incident from literature we, we, we encountered these? What, what was the origin story of your child, Dark Energy? In the 90s, when you were a youngster, uh, we had this idea called inflation. It predicted a flat universe, a critical density universe. We, we had this um, idea of cold, dark matter. These were the driving ideas. They were getting young people like you into the field. They were so beautiful. And they had a problem. Uh, let, let's focus on the critical density problem. So the critical density problem was you have to find enough matter to get to the critical density. And early on, we looked at the measurements that had been made by the astronomers, and um, we realized they were missing the dark matter. And the dark matter is more diffuse than the visible matter, and so and it's harder to measure things that are far away from you. And so we pinned our hopes on the dark matter was going to get the density all the way up to one, up to the critical density. In a, I think it was about 1994, there was a paper, I won't describe the details that really hit me in the face. Um, it involved, we know, at that time we knew how many uh, atoms there were. We just didn't know how, many, how much dark matter there was. And this paper used a very clever technique looking at the ratio of dark matter to ordinary matter in clusters and then scaling it up saying that the total amount of ordinary matter is only about 30%. You're not going to get... That paper really eliminated that the possibility that dark matter was going to take you all the way to one. So when you eliminate the impossible, whatever's left, no matter how ridiculous, I know I'm screwing up the quote, is likely to be the answer. And so you look at what could fill the gap, and what could fill the gap is something like Einstein's cosmological constant. And I'd been writing papers, you know, theorists are always, you know, we're, this is my main prediction, but I got in my back pocket an answer just in case your experiment comes out a different way. Oh, here, look at this paper. The uh, Lawrence Krauss and I wrote a paper saying the cosmological constant is back. And uh, that was in 1995, and in 1998 it was discovered, blah, blah, blah. And then I realized in 1998 that the, the astronomers were going to say, okay, we're done. It's just the cosmological constant. And we do not know that. We absolutely do not know that. And so if you allowed this stuff to be called the cosmological constant, oh my God, you, could, you've, you guys have already measured it to better than 1%. We're done. But we realized, and it wasn't for, just for full employment, it was, we don't know what it is. And so unless we change the name and explain to people why it's mysterious, unknown. I've called it the most profound mystery, not the most important mystery, but the most profound mystery. So it needed a new name. So what is the new name? Well, uh, we got dark matter. That's really good, but it's not matter. And yep. in the technical sense, and it's more like energy than it is like matter. And I'll, I'll just say that and not explain it because it's not worth explaining. So... Oh my God, dark energy and dark matter, dark side of the universe, better, better get that copyrighted right away. So there it was, and then you have to lay out the story. So we don't know what dark energy is. We, we do know that the simplest example of it is Einstein's cosmological constant, but for, I won't go into all the reasons, it's a big puzzle. It is a really big puzzle. And so about the same time, Martin White and I came up with, here's how you determine whether or not it is lambda. It's the, I'll just use the letter, you know it, W. It's the W parameter. And so I made a really big deal of this is really important, and it's got a different name from the cosmological constant because 
It may not be the cosmological constant. And you know this as well as I do. Today, all the measurements are consistent with dark energy just being a cosmological constant. However, if that's the answer, we don't know why. We don't know why such a cosmological constant would be so small. And so I remember the meeting. It was a wonderful meeting in Australia where I rolled out the new name. Actually, I don't know if you've ever seen this. The first name I tried was Funny Energy. And uh, I have a view graph that appeared in the New York Times. You're famously renowned for your sketching, your artistic abilities. The focus groups told me, okay, oh, that's fantastic. You know, that's non-threatening. People will really love it. And then I said, well, it's going to take a billion dollars to figure out what funny energy is. Oh, you need a more serious name than that. And so in August of 1998, uh, at the Mount Stromlo meeting in, in Australia, I said, we're going to call this stuff dark energy. And um, the name has stuck. Some people don't like it. They want to call it dark negative pressure. That, that, I don't think the focus groups are going to like that. Dark energy is pretty good. But it, the purpose, get rid of all the silliness. Two purposes. Number one, in order to make it a scientific target, you can't just say, oh, that funny stuff that's causing the universe to speed up. It needs a short name. And then you need to quantify it a little bit. And you need to differentiate it. So dark matter uh, has worked really, really well, but you have, to, you have to differentiate it from dark matter. So it's got to be slightly different. It's got, it can't be a, a long, complicated name. And you have to be able to explain to people, oh my God, you're just trying to be more famous than Einstein. Oh, no one could ever do that. So why don't you just call it Einstein's cosmological constant? And the simple thing is we don't know that it is. It is the biggest puzzle. It's the most profound puzzle in all of science. And if we want people to... Uh, really spend time trying to figure it out. We got we got to we got to give it the right name. Yeah, and I think it's good. Speaking as somebody who's got a name for uh, a, a, not a name, no pun intended, for neologisms, I came up with the term, name bicep. NASA recently uh, asked me to come up with a new name. Apparently, the name Uranus is very embarrassing. Uh, for some astronomers to pronounce. And we come up with ways around it, workarounds like Uranus, like urine is better than Uranus. So I've been tasked by the NASA task force um, to come up with a new name, and I'm proud I'm going to announce it right now. I've come up with a new name. It shall be known as Erectum. <laughs> and I think I think it's going to stick, but it's up to folks like you. The, the focus groups will come into play. Michael, I want to read. I want to read something to you, and it's a it's it's kind of a hallmark for my for my listeners to uh, to eventually send you more and more uh, uh, of those precious royalty uh, scratch checks. Um, this is from an article you wrote, I believe, about ten fifteen years ago. No, it's twenty years ago. Oh my god. This is incredible, Michael. In Physics Today, and it's about dark energy, and this is a section called Destiny. <laughs> One thing you wrote is clear. Dark energy leads to a revision in our view of cosmic destiny. With matter alone, destiny and geometry are one. Closed universes recollapse, and open or flat universes expand forever. If dark energy is vacuum energy, our flat universe will continue accelerating to a bleak future in 100 billion years. All but a few hundred galaxies nearby will have their light shifted too far into the red to be seen. If dark energy dissipates, the universe will begin to decelerate, possibly even collapse. Then you go on to say, dark energy is one of the deepest and most exciting puzzles in all of science. It is likely that a crazy new idea is needed to explain the cosmic speed up and resolve the cosmological constant problem. That does not mean that every crazy idea is a solution. The payoff will be well worth the effort. We will gain new insights into the nature of matter, space, and time and shed light on our cosmic destiny. And that, you said, was predicated on adding in your nine-year-old son's theoretical work and progress was assured. But, Michael, I want to I want to take a quote from a, um, a very well-known scientist by the name of Alvy Cohen, who um, was uh, <clears throat> in um, Annie Hall. Uh, Woody Allen uh, comes up and his mother says, you know, he's not doing his homework to the psychologist. And the psychologist, why aren't you doing your homework, Alvy? And Alvy says, oh, I just found out the universe is expanding and eventually everything will be so diffused and nothing will be. And his mother goes, shut up, you idiot. Brooklyn's not expanding. How do you deal with the existential dread of your creation, Michael. Um, I've had on Adam Reese, uh, I've had on Brian Schmidt on the podcast, two lovely men who you know very well. They don't seem particularly overwhelmed by the existential 
you know, kind of uh, Weltschmerz, I think is the German term, uh, for, you know, kind of world weariness. Or, does this affect you? I mean, you write so beautifully, so poetically. I can't imagine you haven't thought of the philosophical, just as a man, as a father, as a, you know, as, as, as a scholar. How does this knowledge of something that you played a huge role in unleashing upon the universe, how does it affect you, if at all? Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it doesn't. Um, and I may have gotten that out of my system. I started out being trained in physics. And uh, at Stanford, uh, my advisor wanted me to get more into astrophysics. And so I read a, an astronomy book. It might have been the one by George A. Bell, but they're all the same. It's the one for college courses. And I came away so depressed that was before dark energy, that the universe is so big and we're so small. And um, so I kind of got that out of my system. There are people, as you know, you know, Doug Adams and Lawrence Krauss, Freeman Dyson wrote the kind of first article about the long-term history of the universe. And there's so much to do today and so much to understand today. And I'm sorry, I'm giving you the, the boring, uh, no, it's at okay. least I'm in good I, I, company with two Nobel Prize winners. Two Nobel Pri And the first guest on the Into the Impossible podcast was none other than Freeman Dyson. He was a Jason, and he used to come to La Jolla every uh, summer. For some reason, he didn't like being in you know, Princeton, New Jersey in uh, the middle of January. So he was a brilliant guy. He came down, and uh, we got to know each other. And one of my favorite memories, he met my you know, then four-year-old, and he was 94 or whatever at the time, and I have pictures of them together. He's a lovely man. He was my first guest on this very podcast. So you're in great company, Michael, and you deserve it. I want to ask now about another – I mean, you've been at the center of so many of these really interesting – um, conundrums. And I see you, uh, there are the technicians, there are the kind of people, the workaday people, cash the paycheck and, you know, uh, don't really think about the philosophical implications. I know that you're, you're saying that you've resolved those ph philosophical implications, but what do you make um, of these recent kind of controversies, as our, as Freeman might say, or Britt might say, about the, the Hubble concept, the Hubble tension. I want to get into your work on magnetic fields, which is my preferred solution and, and rectification of the, of the Hubble tension. First explain, is it really a problem that scientists are measuring, you know, this number two different ways to sub percent, you know, uh, precision. And as you pointed out, I think you coined this term too, uh, that, uh, Precision cosmology is, is good, but accurate cosmology is better. I use that without giving you the royalties, but that will now change. Tell me, Michael, what do you make of the so-called Hubble tension? What is it, and what does it yeah, mean so for— Yeah, so the Hubble tension um, talks to the maturity of cosmology. It, it used to be a science with very few facts, and now there are lots of facts. There's enough facts that we can measure things in multiple ways and do cross-checks. And so we can measure how fast the universe is expanding just by looking at the galaxies nearby. It's not easy. It's very hard work because you have to figure out their distances. You can measure it that way. And then you can use a way that's probably more familiar to you using the microwave background. And what you really do is measure how fast the universe was expanding a really long time ago and then say, I know Einstein's equations tell me how the expansion rate should evolve with time, and I can um, run it up to today. And it should agree with what those who measure it doing uh, now get. And so the good news is it does agree uh, to better than 10%. And, oh, my God, when I was your age, getting a 10% measurement of the Hubble constant almost looked impossible, and it involved Wendy Friedman, my Chicago colleague, leading the Hubble Key Project and doing it. So we have two different methods that agree to a, pre a precision that 20 years ago w would have been enviable. But then when you look more carefully and uh, take those numbers very seriously, they disagree, as you say, at, at a few percent level. And... And it's statistically significant. It's not just, oh, you know, because errors of measurement. It, and so this is an important cross-check. Cosmology is not used to having cross-checks. We now have a bunch of them. This is an important one. And so the question is, and there are three outcomes, three possibilities. One, the microwave background could be wrong. I know you would find that, that measuring it from the microwave background could be wrong. 
uh, actually there are four possibilities, uh, the direct measurements could be wrong, both the direct and the microwave background could be wrong, they both could be right, but the extrapolation is wrong because there's something else in the universe besides uh, atoms, dark matter, and dark energy. And that's what gets everyone excited, is that there's something missing from this model. I think you use the term lambda CDM. I know Adam gets very, very excited about that, and that's a possibility. And I, Adam would be the first to say we're not there yet. And then, what, and coming back to dark energy, we had a crisis then. We had a bunch of things that didn't work. I I'm, I'm, uh, mentioned the flatness, but there were other puzzles that didn't work. You add one crazy thing, lambda, and everything works. And so that looked pretty good to me and Lawrence Krauss, and we wrote a paper. Um, today, all of the fixes, they're so complicated, and they just solve one problem. So you, you, know, you put it, Feynman was one of my mentors at Caltech, and he said, you know an idea is good, it's like putting a quarter in the Coke machine and 30 Cokes come out. The golden gumball. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's not happened with the, the fixes. Like early, They have all kinds of names. that I could say early dark energy. I'll say early dark energy is the most popular one. And they don't even quite fix the problem. And then you say, okay, well, okay, let me pretend you fixed the discrepancy. What else are you predicting? What else new is out there? Uh, well, this was just a toy model. It was not, it was not meant to, so it doesn't, that doesn't mean it's not right, but it doesn't have the sound of being correct. And I'm usually pretty good at looking around the corners and this is a real puzzle. I don't see where this is going to end. In fact, it would be wonderful to have a debate where it ended. And in the debate, you flip a coin to decide who takes what side because there are powerful arguments on both sides. Oh, it's got to be new physics. There's an equally powerful argument. Oh my God, that distance scale, measuring galaxy distances is so hard. If you look at all the great astronomers, Hubble was off only by a factor of 10 in measuring distances. I mean, it's, it's very hard to measure distances in the universe. So I don't know how that one's going to end. And, but the the it's either going to end well i guess it could end as the whole cosmology collapses i don't think that'll be the case but or it could end in oh there's a mistake either in the microwave background or the local measurements and now the two agree to one percent so we have this end-to-end -end test or it could be you know what we just discovered just like uh the discrepancy we had with the flatness of the universe we just discovered something new about the universe so it's exciting that's the other misconception among you know lay people and less so among professional scientists, unlike the job of what an experimentalist is supposed to do being not prove a theorist but prove them wrong but uh but actually it's most exciting i I always think it's a little disingenuous though Michael when people used to say you know the most exciting thing about the large hadron collider would be if we don't find the Higgs boson. I'll be like, yeah, I'd be really excited about losing 10 billion euros, you know, just, <laughs> you know, I, that'd be so exciting to me. But, you know, other than that, in this situation, so many flowers can bloom. And one of the ones that I said appeals most to me venally because I've written papers about it with my, uh, <clears throat> with my uh, friends in and, and various locations like Levon Pagosian and, and others about, um, about magnetic fields. So, uh, your paper, and, and this is a sign of just a titanic intellect. So as we were talking, before we started recording, we were talking about your paper with Lawrence Widrow back from 1988. And I said in that paper, you know, it's being cited now as a, um, as, you know, one of the first citations to axions and so forth. And, and you were kind of arguing with me, Michael, but I, I looked up the paper as we we're, as we're talking. I have it downloaded and, uh, and no, nope, it's right there, equation 3-1. Uh, sorry, uh, <laughs> uh, you, you talk about a uh, the, the axion through which, uh, through the anomaly, couples to E dot B, which for those out there, uh, my audience is the most brilliant in the known universe, the multiverse, but uh, that would be a, a forbidden interaction in classical electromagnetism. But Michael is so incredibly um, you know, uh, brilliant that you've forgotten more than most of us will ever know. And one of those things was how an axion, which has become a very popular candidate, for the explanation of dark energy's, you know, sinister uh, older brother, dark matter. Um, I wonder, though, 
I don't want to talk too much about axions unless you want to talk about it. I'm fascinated by them, and it's kind of buttering my bread lately because we're we're doing doing a lot of searches, as is your buddy John Carlstrom and, and the South Pole Telescope. And I like to think I play a little role in that, as I did with search for inflation with Bicep, in that I started to think about uh, these parity violating things back in 2007 as as looking for these forbidden correlation functions in E dot B of C, C sub L E dot B. And people, even John, kind of laughed at me back then, but but now he's he's come around, and I hope to have him on the podcast too. But but unless you want to talk about axions, let's talk about electromagnetic fields because these are the only things that we know for sure exist. We don't know if axions exist. We don't know what dark energy is or you know, maybe if it is a cosmological constant or not. We don't know what dark matter. But we certainly know, good as anything, that magnetic fields exist uh, in you and me on our planet in this meteorite, which you know, blew my chances at a Nobel Prize in some ways. Uh, but I do give these away. If you have a .edu email address, I give them away on my website, briankeen.com. So you have a .edu. I'll, I'll bring you one when I come and see you up there in Venice. But Michael, how do magnetic fields originate in what was the concept for these early magnetic fields? And what would you rate if you were doing a, um, a Hubble tension scorecard, as I would love for you to do, as you did with your magical inflation scorecard? Please tell me, Michael. What would the idea of a primordial magnetic field rank, and what score would you give it for resolving, potentially, the Hubble tension? Well, I would give any solution a pretty low score. Let's go back to dark energy. When Lawrence and I wrote the paper about lambda, I would have given it a chance of maybe 10 or 20 percent being correct, and I really thought it was a good idea. So um, the- A calibrate thing. The, yeah, I want to calibrate it. So. I think any of the solutions I've heard, you know, less than 10% uh, chance of being correct. But that's really high because there's a lot of ideas out there. And you should not trust my opinion. The uh, nature gets the last word and the experimenters get the last word. And nature or ugly experiments kill beautiful theories. And so you can have the most beautiful theory. I don't know if you ever had John Ellis on your show, but he's very distinguished particle physics, physicist. Oh, no, not John Ellis. I had George Ellis. And John Ellis said the first time, and he's a very creative guy, the first time he heard about the Weinberg's Law Model, he said, this is too ugly for nature to have chosen that. And it did. And so just because all this, I find all the solutions uncompelling, my opinion really doesn't count. We've got a problem to solve, and so we need ideas. And, you know, I'll give you, this is advice from an old person. So I did a tutorial with Feynman when I was an undergraduate at Caltech, and so he, he looks at me, just like I'm looking at you right now, and he says, I really envy your ignorance. <laughs> and so I'm going, oh, that's great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Ultimate Feynman. backhanded compliment. Well, <laughs> what he meant was, on the theory side, is that the older you get, the less creative you get, and you know too much, and you get a germ of an idea, and you can just completely discard it. And most ideas, the first rendering of most ideas is just wrong. And so, but if you kill that little germ of an idea, so for example, you know, magnetic fields explaining the, the tension, I'm, what I'm 100% sure of is that the solutions that have been written are not right. Whether or not they have a germ of a good idea, I don't know. Um, and so, and I'm the wrong person to ask because you get old and you get, you know so much more. And worse than that, you know that most ideas are wrong. So, you know, if someone comes in and says, okay, uh, it's your life, the stakes of this question are your life, is this new idea right or wrong? I'm going with wrong because I'm I'm going I'm going with the with the smart money because, and so and it just doesn't matter. There's so many examples. I, neutrino oscillations. All the theorists said, "Oh my God, the neutrino mi mixing angles are really small, and it's matter induced. That's so pretty. Uh, the creator could not have chosen to do that. It's large mixing angles all the way. The creator did not take the beautiful route. So." What young people can do is put ideas out there, and a lot of them are just crap, or not. most of them are wrong. Some of them are even crap. But it's generating those ideas is the hard thing. The easy thing is being the critic, and testing them is not always easy either. But so 
I just don't want to discourage people from having ideas. So my current betting odds on the Hubble problem, I gave you four solutions, um, 25, 25, 25, 25. It's a real puzzle. That's a uniform prior for those of you playing at home. Um, I think maybe if I could be, you know, so temeritous as to suggest what Feynman uh, might have also been implying, you know, and, and he would have had a field day with me because he, he would have been very envious of my ignorance because uh, there was a surfite of it. But there's a feeling that you get. Yeah, I finished reading Moby Dick, you know, 20 years ago. I, I started it 800 times, never finished it. Um, but when I was done, I was like, oh, I really wish I could read this again for the first time. And, you know, you kind of feel that way sometimes when you're building a new experiment, you know, in those heady early days, or I assume a theory, coming up with a, a theoretical idea. But, um, but it's just so, it's, it's, it, is, it is important to realize that, yes, ideas, on the one hand, ideas are cheap, and everybody's got an idea, and, and the hard thing is follow through, which takes a lot more time and attention and, and so forth. But I think being guided by these big principles, trying to do as, as you know, another great orator said, you know, that the mankind's reach should exceed his grasp. That's the challenge. That's what makes it so fun to be a physicist when there are so many different possibilities that, that you could be right, you could be wrong, and, and you should have a little bit, I always say you should have a humble, you know, kind of form of swagger. You should, you should know that you're probably wrong, but if you don't have a little cockiness, you're never going to take on Mother Nature. You know, she's just too powerful. So let's conclude in the next you know, few minutes, if you have a few more minutes, Michael, I'd love to talk about um, your thoughts on, um, on you know, uh, upcoming guests. I have two upcoming guests that you know very well. Uh, one is Katie Fries, um, uh, who you wrote many papers with, but also with, with um, David Schramm, who, uh, who I, I never really got to know David. He passed away, unfortunately, you know, before I came of age. But um, talk about, you know, Katie, um, who's coming. He's, she's actually coming to UCSD in a, in a week to give our uh, prize colloquium here. Um, but talk about their ideas. She's come to attention lately for this notion of dark stars um, and that possibly being an explanation. Uh, I wonder if you could, you know, channel your friend, your late colleague David, and, and say, what would he make of these new ideas and what do you make of, 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 of these very creative ideas like uh, dark photons, dark stars? Help us. You're the king of the dark, Michael, so please opine for us on the state of this, and then uh, we'll, we'll conclude in a bit. David Schramm was my mentor, and um, I, I will never forget the day uh, that that he died. I just, um, I don't even want to think about it. And Katie was a student at Chicago, and David was, was her advisor, and I also worked with Katie when she was a student. And so Dark Stars is really great. Um, I can't possibly believe it's true. Uh, I can't find out anything wrong with it, but most importantly, it's very testable. And I also like um, what you said about the swagger. Katie's had the right amount of swagger that um, you got to let go of an idea if somebody can show you that it doesn't work. But if it's testable, that's very important. And Steve Weinberg once said that you can find countless examples where the theorists did not stick to their ideas enough. The microwave being, background being one, Gamow. uh, they could have predicted it. They could have even anyway. That's it's an interesting. And Dickie, Dickie, Dickie did predict it and tried to measure it, and then he forgot about it. it. Um, and so I think the dark stars. I just can't possibly believe it's correct. And then Case says, "Well, tell me what's wrong with my arguments, and tells me what's wrong with these simulations." And that would be amazing. Um, the dark photons. So this is another one that. Uh, It'd be interesting to get Katie's opinion on this. Here we have a dilemma. Uh, my generation said, guess what? Uh, we've got it down. There's one dark matter particle. Uh, it completes the grand unified theory or the theory of everything. There's just one particle missing. And guess what? That one particle missing also is the dark matter. We've got this really simple story we called the 2010s, the decade of the wimp uh, of the weakly interacting massive particle, and you're either looking for the lightest supersymmetric particle or the axion, and Rocky and I and others said, by, by 2020, we'll be done. We'll, we'll know the answer. And well, of course, we, never, we don't quite know the answer. We haven't ruled either one out, but it's not looking good. And so the young theorists said, 
the new paradigm is the tip of the iceberg is the dark matter particle, and the rest of the iceberg underwater that we can't see is a whole new dark world. All kinds of other particles, dark, dark photons, dark this, dark that. It seems awfully extravagant to me for one problem you invent a whole new world but the uh, I, they've convinced me that I'm being fairly simple minded saying you know we just had one thing left to do and now a question for a tuft uh well he's so smart and he thinks about things in a very deep way um I was at a meeting with him uh 5 years ago and I was trying to think but I would really like to know his opinion on inflation. Roger Penrose, who I don't know if you've had on your show or not, but many times, he does many not times. think very highly of inflation. And no, he, he thinks not. that it's just a, a blind alley. And I, you've probably had Andre Linde, who thinks, you know, yeah. Andre, Andre Linde once said, the only way you can disprove inflation is with a better th theory. You can't do it with an experimental yep. data. And he thinks very highly of it. I, at, uh, Gerard thinks about things in a way that I can't often under, understand, and he's yeah. extraordinarily mathematically powerful. When I hear him talk about black holes, I know I can't understand that. I get confused by that. But I would love to have just open-ended, what do you think about inflation? Are we on the right track? Is it, is it a distraction? Where, where is that train going? Okay, Michael, the last question. I usually ask a bunch of questions based on Sir Arthur C. Clarke. Uh, who is the namesake of this podcast because he said uh, the only way to know the limits of the possible is to go beyond them into the impossible. You brought up Arthur Conan Doyle's similar statement. But I want to um, – and, and sometimes I lay on my department chair uh, Clark's other maxim, which is that for every expert, there's an equal and opposite expert. I love that one. But I'm going to do a different one, uh, also having to do with impossibility, and it's the following quote. When an elderly or distinguished scientist says something is possible, he is very likely to be correct. But when he says something is impossible, he is very likely to be wrong. I want to ask you, Michael, um, what have you been wrong about? Uh, what have you changed your mind about? And, and, sort of, and, and sort of an advice to an earlier form of Michael. I think we just covered the one that I'm struggling with. And I think the, the struggle, struggles are really big. You know, this dark matter thing, have I, for the most of my career, been looking at it the wrong way? That it's either the axion or the neutralino, and you've heard of the WIMP miracle. I hate that term. Uh, it's not, you will not find it in the early universe. Because it, it seems clear to me, I mean, you heard me kind of dismissive. I didn't mean to be dismissive, but saying this whole idea that you're inventing a dark world to explain one experimental fact, that seems so extravagant. But maybe I'm just looking at it the wrong way, that this is the piece, the only piece of the dark world that we can see. And I'm just so fixed in my old ideas that there's just one last thing to find, like Michelson was saying, oh, you know, in the 1900s, physics is done. We're just putting extra decimal places on. So I would say that for me, you're watching a struggle. And I, I give talks, I have to give talks at dark matter meetings, and I'm slowly evolving. I'm at least willing to admit they may be right. And usually I can see around corners and see the end. This puzzle I cannot see around the corner. Michael, I appreciate you so much. Uh, I hope you'll come down to San Diego and maybe give a colloquium of your own. Uh, we'd love to host you here. And uh, it's been a delight, as I knew it would be, and I, I hope someday we can do a part two. It's been a fascinating journey through the history and your philosophy and also the culture and taste that it takes to build a brand as strong <laughs> as the Turner brand. Thank you so much, and uh, best of luck to everyone that you mentioned except for those hated Dodgers. Thanks a lot, Brian. It's been, it's been fun, and I do hope I will get down to San Diego one of these days.